Springfield Church of the Brethren message of the week. Hi, this is Pastor Dave Weiss with the Springfield Church of the Brethren message of the week. This message is entitled Messy Ministry Part 2. Ministry is messy. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes it's messy because of people outside the faith. Sometimes it's messy because of people inside. Like this story, which I heard from my friend Ralph the other day, and he told me about it in Bible study a couple weeks ago, but if it hadn't come from him, I may not have believed it at all. <laughs> Listen to this. A Luzerne County woman drove into the path of an oncoming vehicle as a way to test her faith. Wait, what? <laughs> The story goes on. The woman exhibited no concern about the people who were injured in the crash, the state police said. Bail was revoked for, well, we'll just call her the driver, age 31, who was charged with aggravated assault and other offenses over allegations that she purposely caused the wreck near Weatherly, PA, on January 7th. An investigator said the driver told him that she'd been driving around for a few hours waiting for a calling from God when she decided to drive through the oncoming vehicle. How many of you know it doesn't usually work that way? The story continues. The driver related God took care of her by not having her injured. She expressed no concern or remorse for the victims because God would have taken care of them. Two people in the other vehicle were taken to the hospital for their injuries. I'm telling you folks, you can't make this stuff up. I have so many thoughts as I think of this. First of all, this person is clearly unbalanced, right? I mean, I know there are times in our lives where we're seeking God and it's unclear whether we're hearing from God or if it's just us. But surely, if you're going to do bodily injury to someone else, it's almost certainly not from God, right? I mean, I know God can do the miraculous, but I also know that we're not supposed to put him to the test, I know we're supposed to glorify God, and that usually doesn't happen when our actions send innocent people to the hospital. And then the pastor part of me kicked in. And so I beg you, please, no one ever put me in this position. Now, am I saying God will never bend the laws of science for you? No, I'm saying don't put him in a position where he has to because he doesn't have to. Don't put him to the test and don't put his glory in danger by doing things that can't help but hurt the way people see God. This woman was in a very real sense blaming her actions on God, essentially saying God told her to do this. Now, since she admits to seeking God, it means she likely goes to church. And if she goes to church, she likely has a pastor. And so somewhere in Luzerne County, there's a pastor saying, why? Where in my teaching did she get the idea that this was something she should do? Because I know I didn't teach that. Secondly, now he's going to have to do prison visits and try to figure out how to work through this. And then I think, what possessed her? She sees it as God came through for her because she wasn't hurt. What about the other people? And that's when it hit me. Our faith has got to be more than just about us. Our faith has got to be about others. I mean, she said God took care of her by not having her injured. Does that mean the other people deserved it? No. They were splattered by the consequences of her sin and her choices. I mean, can you imagine what those two people thought? This is going to sound really wrong, but I almost really hope the people who were hurt were strong Christians. Because hearing this story, can you imagine what they think about God and Christians if they aren't? Friends, we follow Jesus. We are tasked with spreading the gospel. The gospel is supposed to be good news, not just for us, but for our world. We have got to be about the business of making life better for other people. We have got to be about the business of being good news. We are here to continue the work of Jesus, preparing the way for his return. We are here to love sacrificially. We are here for the outcasts. We are here to embody the good news. We are here to represent Jesus. This woman thought that God took care of her without ever considering what the effect of her actions would be on anyone else. Jesus, on the other hand, put himself last. He sacrificed his image for the good of others. And then he sacrificed his very life. Think about last week. The Pharisees were offended when Jesus said the man's sins were forgiven. 
They thought less of Jesus because of the good he did, and then he called Matthew when probably no one else would have. When others would shake their heads and think less of Jesus, he chose to call and love Matthew anyway. And then he went to Matthew's house. The Pharisees were right there to complain and discredit him. See, their faith was all about them. If Jesus were really good, he'd be like them. And if he were really the Messiah, he'd be falling in line with them. All Jesus saw was sheep without a shepherd, and Jesus was confident enough to realize who he is. He didn't have to fall in line with the Pharisees, nor does he have to fall in line with us. No, he is Lord, and we need to fall in line with him. He wasn't here to impress the prideful. He was here to seek and save that which was lost. He wasn't here so the powerful would think more of him. He was here to lead the broken ones home. Jesus disregarded his reputation with the prideful to rescue those in need. And to do that was to get messy. Last week he dealt with a tax collector. This week he's going even further out. This week Jesus is going to Samaria. Now, Samaria is the home of the Samaritans. You remember them. You probably know the parable that Jesus taught. This is a parable even people outside the church know. But I'm going to tell it a little different today. There was a guy walking the streets of Washington, D.C. when all of a sudden two muggers came by out of nowhere, robbed him, beat him, and left him for dead. Not long after, Vice President Pence came on the scene. He saw the guy laying there but thought, I really need to get back to the Senate chamber. There's an important decision that needs to be made, and I might need to break the tie. So he walked by on the other side of the street. Not long after, Donald Trump came by. He too saw the man, but he thought, the Chinese ambassador is coming by, and how will it look if I'm late for such an important appointment? So he too kept walking by. Not long after, Nancy Pelosi came by. She saw the man, she ran to him, she stopped the bleeding with some torn up paper she had in her bag, bound his wounds by tearing off the sleeves of her white jacket, she helped him to her limo, had her driver take them to the nearest hospital, and since the man did not have Obamacare, she volunteered to pay the man's bills herself. Now, who is the best politician? Is anyone offended by that story? <laughs> Why did I tell it like that? I know how most of my congregation leans politically, and I was trying to illustrate how Jesus' audience may have felt when he told that story. See, the Samaritans were someone most of them wouldn't have crossed the street for. And so Jesus sets the story to make the Jewish people, the Israelites, the victims, and put some of their prominent people among the villains, and a Samaritan, their enemy, the hero. This is how the Israelites and the Samaritans felt about each other. The Samaritans were the result of the exile. When the northern kingdom Israel was carried off by the Assyrians, they left some people behind to care for the land. These people intermixed with the Assyrians. They blended their faith in the God of Israel with the idols of the people and became the Samaritans. The Samaritans and the Jews pretty much hated each other. Most of the Jewish religious leaders would have walked miles and miles and miles out of their way to avoid even setting foot in Samaria, and those who didn't took the quickest route possible and didn't stop. Their faith was all about them. They were in, and the Samaritans were out. And as far as they were concerned, the Samaritans could stay out. Who are your Samaritans? Who would you go out of your way to stay away from? Is there anyone in your life who, as far as you're concerned, is out and can stay out? Now, let me be clear. This is not a put down. This is not me calling us racist or anything like that. This is me calling on us, which includes me, to check ourselves and our attitudes about others. See, the Pharisees were desperate to stay away from the Samaritans, but Jesus didn't think like that because he knew what we need to know and remember. Everybody needs Jesus. Jesus was all about going to people that the respectable people avoided. Jesus is in Samaria. The disciples have gone off to get some food, but Jesus was tired, so he sat down alone and took a break. It was about noon. Let's pick it up with the text, John 4, verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Well, there are a couple things we might miss here. 
First of all, in the days before running water, everyone had to go to the well to get their water, and this job, surprise, 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 fell to the women. Now, noon was the hottest time of the day. It was a time when people would rest in the shade. It was not a time when the women went for water. From this, we may get the idea that this woman may have been going to the well at this unusual time because she was avoiding the other women. She was someone the others didn't want to be around. She was an outcast among the outcasts. But remember... Jesus doesn't think like everyone else. His thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. If we want to serve him well, we must seek the mind of Christ to follow his example, right? I mean, Jesus is God, but he still faced a lot of rejection, and so he strikes up a conversation by simply asking for water. It's an easy enough request, right? She's already getting water. Just share a little. It's just common decency, right? Well, look at verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Ordinarily, it would be common courtesy, but they represent two people groups who have not gotten along in a very long time. There were also rules about how men and women interacted, especially with rabbis. No rabbi would have had a one-on-one conversation with a woman for any length of time. It wasn't done. Add to this the fact that Jewish tradition, though not God's law, considered a Samaritan woman to be, to be perpetually unclean. So even to drink from her vessel would have made Jesus unclean. This is an interaction no one but Jesus would have had. See, their faith was all about who is in and who is out, but Jesus was about bringing those who were out in. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is offering her something far beyond water from a well. He was offering her the water of life. And from here, she starts making excuses. How can you offer me water? You don't even have a jug. And then look at verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Now note how she says that. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. But when she speaks of Jacob, she calls him our father. She's reminding Jesus of their common heritage. They're both descendants of Jacob and Abraham. And then she goes goes further. How can you give me better than this? This well here in my homeland is from our great ancestor Jacob. Are you better than him? Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus tells her he offers something far greater than regular water. He's offering eternity. She's an outcast, even among the outcasts, and yet he offers her life. Now, she clearly doesn't get it. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's thinking, well, if he has this water, I won't have to go and haul water anymore. But it's more than that. Remember, she's the one who comes at noon when none of the other women are there. This is probably less about laziness and more about shame. With the water that Jesus offers, she can avoid other people. She can avoid her shame. Can I tell you, that's never what Jesus wants. And so he confronts her problem head on. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, when I first read this, I thought, wow, Jesus is being a little cruel there. And then I thought, oh, well, nothing gets past Jesus. I no longer believe either of those is the case necessarily. Oh, nothing we do escapes his notice, and he doesn't want us to avoid our shame. He wants us to get freedom from it. He wants us to repent and come to him to be set free. This is not confrontation for condemnation. This is confrontation that leads to liberation. Our objective in reaching out is not to shame people out of their sin. None of us is in a position to do that. We have sin of our own. 
No, the objective of reaching out is to point people to the one who can set them free. This is never about showing people how far out they are or even how far in we are. It's to bring people in, help them to find freedom, and send them back out to share the good news. Verse 19, sir, the woman replied, I can see that you are a prophet. She sees very clearly that Jesus knows things. He has no earthly way of knowing. And it seems like he's a little too close to home. This is getting uncomfortable, so she tries to change the subject. She starts to talk about rules and regulations and where they can and can't worship and what amounts to denominational differences. She's trying to deflect to someone else and something else. But notice this, Jesus doesn't allow it. To change the subject and be drawn into a religious argument with, will not advance his cause and it will not set her free. Instead, Jesus gets back to the matter at hand. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. He's saying this is not about Samaritans and Jews. This is about the Father. Yes, he brought about the, Sam the Savior excuse me, from the Jews. But Jesus also knows that the time has come when he will be lifted up and draw all people to himself. And brothers and sisters, we live in that time. We can't afford to get distracted by all the debates and discussions. We can't afford to get diverted by division. We need to get back to the truth, the simple truth. We need to get back to Jesus. We need to get back to salvation by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. Verse 24, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, look at the conclusion she comes to. Oh, she may not know, but she's starting to suspect the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus, who has kept this a secret from all Israel at this point, or at least he tried, speaks it plainly to this outcast among the outcasts when Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God, King of kings and Lord of lords, Lord and Savior and the one who sets us free. Guys, he is the hope in our world, the hope of sinners. And notice something. She didn't come to him. He came to her. He didn't act like her sin was okay, but neither did he condemn her. Instead, he told her the truth and freed her. What was her response? Look at verse 29. She went back to her people and said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Jesus told her the truth that sets men free. Think about it. He didn't seek out the mayor or the chief of police. He didn't seek out the wealthy and the powerful. He went to the well at a time of the day when the only ones who would show up were the broken and the hurting. He found the outcasts among the outcasts. He didn't look for the ones who were most in. You could argue he found the one who was farthest out. And when he reached into her life, what was her response? She told everyone. And when they heard from her, they came. Skip down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Guys, that's the power of a testimony. And for some people, that's the most effective preaching. It demonstrates the power of God in your life. Always be prepared to share your testimony. And in case you don't know what that is, if you faced a test and God brought you through it, that's your testimony. I mean, combine that with an invitation to come and see, and you have what most, most of what you need to reach lost people. You don't have to be rich and powerful. You don't have to be well-spoken. You don't have to be a polished preacher. You don't have to be important in the eyes of the world. You can even be an outcast among the outcasts. You just have to love Jesus and know who he is. She said to them, come and see. And guess what happened? They came and saw. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed two days. Uh-oh. Now it's going to get messy. The religious leaders go out of their way to avoid Samaria, and they would never enter the home there, much less eat with them. 
Jesus went and stayed two days. That's going to make some people really mad. Look at verse 41. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. See, if Jesus really cared about his reputation with the religious leaders, he would have avoided all of this. I mean, they hated the Samaritans. They avoided them. Jesus went to them and saved them. You know what this was, right? It was messy. Jesus just went and brought the hated Samaritans into the kingdom of God. He went to the outcast of outcasts and used her to bring about revival in her city. And you know some people didn't like that. I think about the lady in the story at the beginning, the driver. She knew, or at least she believed she was in, and so she put everyone else at great risk, not caring if the people coming toward her, just minding their own business, were in or out. It's not about who's in or who's out. It's about being grateful enough that you're in to go out. It's about putting others first. It's about going to where the people are, maybe even the outcast, maybe even the outcast of the outcasts, meeting them where they are and bringing them in. You know, some people didn't like it then. You know, some people aren't going to like it now. That's okay. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Ministry is messy, but salvation is forever. So let's get messy. Amen. This has been the Springfield Church of the Brethren message of the week from Pastor Dave Weiss.